Today's episode is brought to you by BlockFills, powering digital trading. Very happy for a very special conversation on forward guidance today. We have three experts on the topic of commercial real estate. Happy to welcome back John Tuhig, head of whole loan trading at Raymond James, Thomas Asavia, head of commercial real estate economics at Moody's Analytics, and Victor Kalinog, global head of research strategy for real estate private markets at Manulife Investment Management. John, I'm going to start off with you. Just how bad is it out there? We're reading headlines uh, you know, day by day about pain in the commercial real estate market and because it's private, you know, tr uh, transaction volumes are down, so it, it's not being realized in the price. Just how bad is it out there in commercial real estate? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. I think it's extend and pretend at the moment. I think that's kind of the theme. Uh, I don't think true financial stress has hit it, thankfully, to a, a pretty strong economy. But there are certainly signs of trouble. We're certainly seeing uh, a lot of our customers uh, see maybe maturity defaults as, as this kind of higher for longer uh, train persists and institutions struggle with what that refinance market looks like as commercial real estate loans kind of move through a, a higher interest rate window. So I still think, um, Jack, we're in early innings, but there are definitely some signs of, of cracks. And so let's just talk about some facts. So, John, we, we were talking about a Wall Street Journal article today that cited that uh, an, an aggregate commercial real estate CRE prices down 16% since March of 2022. Office are down tw uh, 31%. Industrial warehouse down 8%. And multifamily, aka apartment buildings, down 20%. Uh, and so that, as well as uh, hotels, are you know, what make up a lot of commercial real estate. So do those figures sound roughly right to you, Victor, as someone who you know is, is intimately familiar with the uh, somewhat opaque world of commercial real estate? Are those property values uh, declines? Are they a ballpark in aggregate, you know, close to, to accurate? So the cynic would probably say that, well, where are values if values are in the quote unquote eye of the beholder? I'm going to defer to Tom later for income drivers, but from a green shoots point of view, I will just proffer it up there that on the income side, on the income side, which you haven't brought up, Jack, it's been remarkably stable because of a relatively strong economy for a recession that didn't quite happen, right? But on the value side, as uh, you mentioned, it's directionally similar. Let me share some numbers from NACREF, which tends to track institutional grade properties where institutional investors like the manual lives of this world tend to invest and or use as benchmarks. No surprise from a timings point of view, value declines began at or around the middle of 2022 for institutional grade properties. The timing of that is no coincidence given the fact that the Fed started raising rates from 0.25% in March 2022, right? So I was just going to compare some of the numbers that you cited earlier. It's directionally similar, about the 10.23% total decline peak the current middle of 2022 to the middle of 2023. It's intuitively led by the office sector, about an 18.4% decline since the middle of 2022. The least decline, which is surprising for some, but not me, is retail at 5.72%. Hasn't been much of a run-up anyway from the great financial crisis and has arguably been struggling with and figuring out this whole structural change from e-commerce for at least two decades. Multifamily down about 8.8%. Industrial and hotel down roughly a bit less, but about the same, 73 to 7.4%. A few caveats, just because we need to keep things honest. All of this is based in around 11,000 institutional grade properties, 10,893 to be exact. That's generally the kind of properties that institutional investors favor anyway for what are called core, core plus funds, which tends to invest in stabilized properties as opposed to new construction. Uh, much of the valuation, which is what I started out with, it'll rely on appraisals versus actual transactions. That's really useful, by the way, for times of high disruption, like, well, now, when transaction volumes decline, and so you have less data points to lean on if your index is transaction-based. Tom Lasavia knows all about that, but it's also open to that critique of whether appraisers are valuing properties properly, or as John has hinted, there might be lags for when values go down or, frankly, go up. Back to you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Victor. Wow, you do my, my job for me. So that's 16% of aggregate C CRE, that's roughly accurate? 16% decline? Yeah, from March 2022. From an institutional grade, the, the, the number is 10.23%, but it's been declining since at or around middle of last year. Okay, so let's say a, you know, a modest double-digit decline in values. That is how much the properties are worth. And there, those properties are, you know, have been well worth less as interest rates rise. So uh, you know, comparatively, based on a discount rate, maybe the building should be worth less. And then interest expense for you know, property developers who you know, frequently use debt to, to buy and build commercial buildings, their interest expense goes up. So on the value side, it's, it's not great news. And that's what you were reading all these articles about. But uh, Victor, you hinted that on the cash flow side, it actually... Uh, is not as, you know, it's actually somewhat uh, uh, good, maybe. Uh, Thomas, tell us about that, and as well as your general outlook. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to uh, pop the champagne on the cash flow side of things, but <clears throat> it is not nearly as bad uh, from the space market perspective compared to the capital market. You know, when we're looking at multifamily, we had a huge run up in rents. We're finally seeing a, a bit of let's say, relief for some of those renters that were being squeezed a little bit. Uh, we've been flat through the first six months of this year. Looks like there's maybe some increases for the second half as uh, recession probabilities decline a little bit. Uh, if we move on to, to office, you know, it's, it's a bit of a surprise. But if you look at the aggregate numbers, not much movement there downward. Yes, uh, we're definitely hearing... Signs of concessions, uh, extra free rent, but not nearly the expected maybe 20, 25% declines that we've seen in other downturns. Uh, this is not a financial crisis, at least not of yet, and maybe we can get to that a little bit later, but all of these office using firms, for the most part, have held up well when it comes to their revenues, uh, their profits. They've been able to continue to pay rent. They've been able to kick the can a little bit on their decisions whether or not to decrease space. Again, I don't want to get ahead of us. I'm sure we're going to talk all about these things. But I think that's an important bit of context to see why office hasn't come down in the way that some may have thought 18 months ago. Uh, retail, industrial, uh, retail's a bit of a moment, but uh, the base is pretty, pretty weak there. Uh, retail hasn't really grown from a rent perspective in many years, starting to see a little bit of uptick as we're reaching that new equilibrium, I think, when it, in the context of e-commerce. And then on the industrial side, we're still seeing a bit above average rent growth. Thanks, Thomas. So on the income side, these properties are still, you know, generating uh, some, some decent income. So if interest rates were still at zero, or uh, you know, the borrowing rates were still at two percent, the ten-year at two percent, maybe we wouldn't be talking about this at all. But they're not. The ten-year is above four percent, and borrowing rates are, you know, a spread above that. Federal Reserve raised five hundred and twenty-five basis points in, in over a year. And so interest expense is up dramatically for uh, property developers. And so how does that impact the uh, ability of, of developers to, to hold that debt? And to what degree are they hedged? John, I want to bring you back in here because uh, you, you know, uh, your, your firm, you, you trade uh, whole loans all, all day, uh, some of which you are involved in commercial real estate. So here we're putting up a chart of the maturation of U.S. commercial property loans. And you see that a lot of them are coming loan in, uh, coming due in 2023, I mean, you, it's time to pay it back, uh, as well as 2024, 2025, 2027, and, and 2026. So how, uh, m how big is this maturity wall coming uh, uh, to the commercial real estate developers who have to pay their money back? And how prepared are they to, to, to pay it back? And how prepared are the lenders uh, in case they don't get their money back? So... Victor and Tom kind of alluded to this. We just came off of a, of a commercial real estate conference two weeks ago in, in Louisville. We were talking about this and, and encouraging our bank and credit union customers to really look out next 12 to 18 months, particularly those loans that are going to adjust uh, or come to maturity. Because a lot of the commercial real estate loans we see are usually five fives. There's an index associated. It's usually associated with prime. 
Uh, so there's sometimes it's associated with SOFR. Five, five, uh, meaning so, it's fixed for five years. And then for five. To, yeah, yeah. And then adjust. And then it usually balloons in, in, the, in the 10th year. And it's typically on a 25 year AM, not always. Um, you know, in, in those regards, if, if that loan is maturing here in the next 18 months or, or adjusting in the next 18 months, you, you need to have a real honest conversation uh, with, the, with the borrower, with the guarantor uh, to kind of understand what that payment shock is going to be. Um, and so a lot of the things that we're starting to have conversations around are what we would call maturity defaults, where, OK, that that period of time has come and can or can they not have the, the higher payment? They're still making a payment. Maybe they're not able to put more equity into the property. Maybe they are. Maybe that's part of the, the modification uh, that they may be considering and talking through. But we're really strongly encouraging customers to have those conversations early to prepare for this particular chart so that they know what's coming due soon. And then, you know, putting a plan together on how they might respond to that, Jack. So I want to explore what is a maturity default? Is it, you know, how does it differ from a regular default? And then let's put some numbers on this. This chart is from the excellent work uh, that Thomas's team does at, at Moody's of in commercial mortgage-backed securities for office. So this is a highly specific part of the market. But uh, 36% of the uh, loans in this office CMBS market that have matured this year so far have entered mat uh, um, uh, maturity default. And I mean, this is a you know, uh, fringe data point, but 69% of, of, of those loans that uh, matured in June uh, entered maturity default. So we're not talking about small numbers here. So uh, just ex explain what a maturity default is. And I mean, does that mean what? The loan's no good? I mean, if, if a loan was worth 100 cents on the dollar, when it enters maturity default, if, if they had to trade it and they called you and your team up, John, I mean, how much is it worth then? There's several different ways we can take this and I'll let Victor and Tom kind of follow behind me, but the, the lender has a choice, all right? The, the due date, the final payment date was uh, uh, September 1st. Uh, and, and the customer has a, uh, either has to come back to them and say, all right, great. Um, you know, we, we want new terms and it's, you know, prime plus 350 or SOFR plus 450, whatever that number is. Okay, well, my payment has changed now. Well, I, I can't make that payment. Uh, my my tenants are not there. I wasn't able to raise rents enough, whatever that you know cap rate might be that I'm associated with it. And, and so I'm I'm still willing to pay. I'm still willing to pay yesterday's payment, but I may not be able to pay tomorrow's. And the the lender has a real question to kind of to ask themselves: Do they do they want to foreclose? Uh, do they want to kind of go down the the credit avenue? Can can they find some other lender that might be willing to, to refinance that loan out and away from them? And if so, that's somebody else's problem. Or do kind of what I said a, a moment ago, extend and pretend. Do we allow the customer to modify the loan to kind of limp forward in this higher interest rate, but maybe they forgive a payment, or maybe they allow them to go interest only for a moment or modify whatever that cash might be. Or if you can, in a, in a perfect world, get them to put more equity in, get, get them to kind of revalue the asset. But in the lack of trading data that is there and the lack of assets that are trading, kind of as Victor alluded to, that can sometimes be a problem uh, for both the lender and the borrower. Tom or Victor, anything that you might jump in beyond that? I do think that there is a focus point here. Unfortunately, we're going to have to pick on one particular property type, right? Jack, John, you've spoken about it. It's not exactly the elephant in the room. It's it's the office sector. It's the uncertainty around the future of the use of this asset class. And Tom's been tracking this pretty intensely, but it's really, really hard to forecast where in, even the income drivers from that property type is going to come from over the next few years. I'll give you a sense of my world prior to my joining Manual Life as head of research and strategy. We created all of these models, right? And you're like, if you're trying to forecast income drivers, how do you do that when you've got a bunch of very, very large employers who are still not sure about their space needs over the medium to long term? And so I just want to like take a step back and go and say, Yes, Jack, we're going to hop all over the place, different property types, even alts these days, data center, self-storage, great factoid, a lot of the funds that were raised from so-called dry powder from private equity going to self-storage, more than half of it, right? And so, but, but we're talking about distress and there the poster child, unfortunately, is the office sector. So that, that's my quick quick focusing point of view because we can hop around and these multi-families dynamics are pretty different versus the office sector. But right now it's office. It's been in the crosshairs for a while. 
And if there's a green shoot to this, it's probably retail breathing a sigh of relief going, we've been in the crosshairs for 20 years and maybe now it's offices. Glad today. it's somebody else this time. Right. Hey, yeah. Yeah. right. And multifamily hey, Victor, is wait, wait. retail is just like uh, you know, malls and stuff like that. Th- Thomas. Yeah, no, Victor, I was just going to comment and say, does this mean I can't trust any of your legacy models? I, I, hear, I hear you're rewriting all of them. So good for, maybe, they, maybe they need a complete revamp. Go ahead. No, no. So, so Jack, before we move on, I actually have a pretty interesting statistic, again, coming from the CMBS universe. Uh, we have an extremely low payoff rate for August maturity. So we just had the August remittance data come in, uh, about 16%. So we're looking at 509.5 million that didn't pay off. Uh, What's interesting about this, though, and and John mentioned it earlier, is nearly every one of those properties, uh, of those loans, were still performing. There were still payments being made on them. And this is within office, right, specifically. So, you know, again, there was some cash flow still coming in, right? There was enough to continue to make a payment and, you know, maybe remain good on on this loan and go into the special servicing, go into those workouts and see where we could go with that. So that's an interesting data point. Again, I think there, you know, definitely more stress to come, uh, but it is intriguing to see the performing nature of many of these uh, maturing loans. Can you just uh, repeat that data point again about CMBS payments in July? Yes. So we have about a 16% payoff rate. So for those loans maturing in August, about 16% paid off. So went through a refinance. Yeah, went through a refinance, actually moved forward. Um, That's about $509 that didn't. And that would be 84% of that month entered maturity default of some kind or, or maturity default or uh, what's it called? Um, modified payment. Modified, yeah. yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean default, but it does mean that, you know, we have not gotten to that point where there was a refinance. There wasn't the refinance prior that allowed that balloon payment to be paid and to move forward. So obviously we're we're in this transition period, and there that uh, John said, what extend and pretend? Well, yeah. And John or, or anyone, uh, have you in your career? Have you has it ever been that case where oh, in Office CMBS, eighty four percent of uh, borrowers are not paying the balloon payment on time? Like is that or is this unprecedented? I, mean, I think a lot of people want to draw parallels to two thousand eight, which was more of a mortgage crisis. Um, than, than, you know, this, but it, it's a similar story. Mortgages though, I mean, they, they're fully amortizing, right? And, and either you can make the payment or you can, I think the differential here being a balloon payment in commercial, a lender has an option, right? I mean, they're not getting their full principal back in that. They're, uh, uh, the idea is to refinance and, and, and extend it. So um, the issue here though, Jack, is that we haven't hit the wall. We haven't really had a credit event. I mean, the most forecasted recession in the history of ever never really came to be at the end of the day, uh, or maybe it's 12 months from now. Um, but the longer we are in that higher for longer and, and the, the more benign the economy is, I think the greater this problem becomes because more of those loans in that debt wall continue to have to refinance into a higher interest rate. Lenders have their cost of funds continuing to grow. Their margins continue to get compressed. And that kind of exacerbates the challenge going forward. They really, really need rates to fall so that we can get back to kind of yesterday's payment stream and yesterday's cash flow levels, uh, and, and as opposed to be slowly kind of limp into this. As to your question specific, have we ever been into a, a window of time where we've had you know 80%? Uh, I, I don't have that particular number uh, in, in my head that I could pull out, but I would think that uh, Tom or Victor would probably say that's historically a pretty high figure. I, I would guess that's pretty true. And Victor, who owns the equity in all these commercial uh, uh, properties? You know, later we can get onto who owns the loans, and it's not just the banks. And you know, I want you know, want to ask John about that. But in terms of who owns the equity in the buildings, 
who are the developers and who are the investors who invest with the developers. There is a uh, you know a publicly traded REIT market you know for office REITs, multifamily REITs, but it's my understanding that that's only a, a fraction of the market. So who when we talk about you know a sixteen percent decline or a ten percent decline in property values, who's kind of feeling those those uh, uh, declines? It really does vary by geography, right? And there's still a whole lot of commercial properties out there, particularly in the U.S., even more so in Asia from a relative proportion point of view, that are really owned by private owners. This would be private equity, real estate firms, smaller owners that don't necessarily list their shares and or are compelled by regulators to, for example, value their assets on a periodic basis. If you want to be honest about it, you do have institutional investor pressure. So I'm talking about private equity real estate, just because we have a bit of a window on that. You're going to take a look at data points published by Surprise, PEAR, P-E-R-E, private equity real estate. You've got institutional real estate investor, IER, REI. They trend that stuff out. And when you take a look at their annual rankings for how much funds are raised, for example, that's one measure of who's shelling out the capital, who's raising capital to buy these things from a private point of view. The ones that typically top that list, you'll see names like Blackstone. You'll see names like Brookfield. And they are, depending on their corporate structure and domicile, Brookfield's a Canadian company, for example, they have different reporting requirements and pressures internally and externally as to when. Hey, this is just not an asset that's necessarily marked to market as frequently as public equities. And I think that addresses part of what John's trying to point out here, where, hey, if it's going to be higher for longer, where are values really going to go? And what slice of the elephant are we viewing here? Green Street does a great job. They were cited all over the place. So does MSCI and RCA when they're coming to take a look at which slice of the elephant is at. But it, it, there's, there's opacity there. There really is opacity because much like that story on the resi side with a lot of homeowners that refinanced at really, really low rates in 2021, not really needing to sell at this point, right? Well, will home prices, are home prices just stable? Because, is there a floor on home price declines because of that less of a need to actually revalue stuff from the transaction side? Is the same analogy appropriate for commercial real estate at that point because of that relative private ownership and opacity that's out there? So yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there because of course we can talk for an entire hour about yeah. this, but back to you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. And yeah. How big is the delta between the quoted prices you're seeing in the publicly traded REITs, which you know trade every minute of every trading day, which own very similar properties, to the uh, privately traded REITs that you know mark their positions either every month or every quarter, and who, by the way, if they net asset, net asset value stay high, they get a you know larger percentage, or um, you know they get a percentage of that, so they kind of have interest as to have a, a, a high value. Um, property. So how I, I know that Delta ex exists right now, but how wide is that Delta, Delta Victor? And would you say any, was there any time in your career or uh, where it's been this wide? I'll give you the lags. Usually public rates and public valuations tend to lead, quote unquote, private measures of valuation by anywhere from two to three quarters, right? So I'll give you that lag. And so when you're taking a look at, you know, things like read prices versus net asset value, which, by the way, has been improving of late because equity markets in the U.S. have actually been, quote unquote, recovering, except maybe for the last week or so. Right. Then maybe we're looking at, as John mentioned, another two, three quarters or so when private returns and private numbers will continue to fall. I, I'll give you where they're at right now on the make reef side. Again, I think I cited some of these numbers earlier. We've really only seen about four quarters worth of property price declines, only three for hotel and industrial, right? And that's, I think, the question we're all trying to answer in this conversation. Is it over? The journal article, I think, today stated that it's another 12 months. Is that right, John? That's yeah, six to twelve is what they mentioned. Yeah, and then it'll converge, right? If that kind of lines up with my two to three quarter lead lag, public versus private, where you're like, over the next six to twelve months, we're going to see some kind of reckoning here. Fingers crossed.
Today, I want to tell you about BlockFills. It's a financial tech firm that offers crypto trading solutions for institutional investors. On Forward Guidance, we talk a lot about liquidity, and there's a reason. It's incredibly important when you're trying to enter and exit a position. Liquidity is the kind of thing where when it's there, it's easy to come by. But when it's not, it can cost you a ton of money, especially if you're a large institutional investor. What Blockfills does is provide liquidity as a service. They source liquidity for you from over 30 global venues, not only on all the exchanges, but also over the counter. Their OTC desk is prolific and can help you execute large trades and save a lot of money. Blockfill's mechanism Phoenix is a software as a service that gives you everything, trading, risk management, on-chain data, the heat map, the analytics, the charting, the execution, the order flow. It simplifies all aspects of the trade cycle to power your digital trading and make it much easier for you. If you don't have all of this in one easy place, you're gonna get distracted, you're gonna miss things, and I'm telling you, that's gonna hold you back. So if you're an investor looking for deep liquidity on a platform that combines everything you need on one easy platform, Blockfills should be on the top of your list. Go to blockfills.com slash open to apply for an account. That's blockfills.com slash open. Blockfills also offers prime lending on and off ramp transactions between crypto and fiat and much, much more. Thanks, and let's get back to the interview. Where hopefully we'll have a bit better guidance on where rates, is it hashtag higher for longer? And maybe I'll put Tom on the spot here. Tom, like what, what's, where, where's, where will we settle when it comes to the 10-year treasury over the long run because of this regime? I'll tell you where CBRE is. They're at around 3.5%. They're, they're, they're seeing it spike, but it'll come down. Is that a hopeful thing? Because CBRE Economics is affiliated with a brokerage that wants to see it come down. I think down. they'd like to see that happen. Right. I think that would be already stands for real estate, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not so optimistic of that decline. Certainly not anytime soon. Obviously, there'll be volatility through business cycles, as there always is. But the neutral rate of interest seems to be a bit higher than it's been in the last couple of decades. And Powell has, you know, somewhat uh, mentioned that in a lot of his speeches over the last uh, few months, where we have a bit of a labor market imbalance, even though the JOLTS report recently showed that, hey, quits are down, job openings are down a little bit, but we're still in a situation with a tight labor market. Uh, demographics aren't super favorable when it comes to that. And if you have this type of tight labor market and a resilient consumer, you might be in a situation where interest rates no longer have to be at historic lows to support uh, the economy and to promote the target 2% inflation rate that the uh, Fed wants to get to. So yeah, we're, we're forecasting right now that our equilibrium or neutral rate of interest is around uh, for the 10 year treasury is about uh, 4%. 4%, so slightly lower than it is now. Let's say, uh, John, that you know, interest rates stay high and the 10 year goes to, it stays at you know, 4% or maybe even goes up to 5%. What happens with all of you know these property developers who entered maturity default? What happens if you know they they bet that interest rate would go down and they they can't handle the the interest expense? At what point does this start to uh, go from a maturity default to a default default? And uh, you know how can different owners of uh, lenders to real estate, the commercial real estate, such as uh, you know CMBS, uh, but also banks and insurance companies, how can they handle that? What what do, what do you see going forward? In the near term, it's it's more margin compression. Right, their 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 cost of funds are rising. Their interest payments aren't quite rising with them. If the borrower can't afford uh, to to pay that higher adjusted margin or or prime plus X or SOFR plus X and margin, uh, so it, it's margin compression. And, and then the, the longer we wait, the the I think the, the further the conversation comes into we truly get into a to a credit crisis. Does unemployment start to finally let out? We we talked a little about the jobs number this week, which have have moved markets and we've seen rates kind of fall here recently. But um, as we get closer and closer to a soft landing, a hard landing, a no landing, a slow session, Tom, to, to give Chris Taritas some love on the uh, on the conversation, um, that's the part to me that I kind of continue to look at. There's, there's no forced sellers presently. There's some opportunistic sellers. We have a lot of our customers talking right now about fourth quarter about potentially taking a loss and getting rid of some of their problem assets, particularly office, 
uh, being more strategic about it because they are starting to finally come around to the fact that we are in higher for longer uh, and they are starting to see and feel that that uh, margin compression, which is a, a feel good story for them, for them and their investors, where they can say, we got rid of the margin compression. We got rid of the problem assets. We've now freed up that capital to go put it into higher uh, new origination earning assets that can qualify at the kind of current debt yields and cap rates that are needed. Uh, and, and that's the the story that a lot of our customers are coming into the fourth quarter trying to evaluate so they can see what this might look like as they get into you know the middle part of next year. John, just going to ask another question for you. In our last conversation with your colleague, Randy Woodward at Raymond James, the sound of, of, of how I understood you were describing the state of the loan trading market at that time for commercial real estate was not a whole lot was trading. And you know, you'd either trade a loan at $100 for a property, you know, a loan against a property that everyone knows is, is money good, or it's, oh, we have a problem. You know, this is going at 50 cents. How has the liquidity in the commercial real estate loan market, which you know you witnessed firsthand, how has that changed over the two or three months since we did that interview with with Randy? Yeah, Tom, Victor, and I were on the the panel back in guys, what was it, April or May for the Raymond James conference, and and one of the terms that was coined by uh, Owen Lefebvre from Bank of Tampa was trophies and trash, uh, and I still think that's that's the case today. Um, trophies and trash, your your best asset, your jewel which has great cash flows, great tenants, strong rents, uh, that, that's fine. That one's trading, trading strongly. Uh, and then that dog, the office that Victor's speaking to, that the tenants have fled, it's in San Francisco. Um, we all know kind of the, uh, the forecast there. It's, it's 10 years before they can convert that asset into condos or repurpose it. And it's a, it's a long-term fixer-upper play. And I know I need to sell it at 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, those are the two type assets that are kind of moved, which speaks to the valuation issues that both Tom and Victor have been mentioning, the lack of transactions, the lack of transparency. Victor used the word opacity. Uh, you know, It's a very opaque market in that without those data points, those comps to pull from, it's very difficult to say what those valuations, how real they are. And I, I, in the Wall Street Journal article and, and Victor's comment on you know commercial real estate values are down 10, 15 percent, 16 percent, whatever number is, I think that's really hard to peg just because of the lack of trades to really truly say, is that a real number or is there just not many data points to validate that? Hey, I, since you did mention San Francisco in a specific geography on topic, can I just interject somewhat of a more positive take on this? I'll give you uh, some perspective from our neighbor up north because one, Manual Life is a Canadian company, and two, I have global in my title, so I do have my part of my remit is to take a look at places other than the U.S. Really interesting factoid: Did you guys know that there are generally lower markdowns for Canadian properties and even Canadian office properties? Maybe I'd estimate a third or less versus the U.S. And so think about that. If we're looking at 16% in the U.S., it's a fairly marginal 5% markdown for Canadian office. Well, what's, what's driving all that? Well, one, as Jack had mentioned, number one, in the U.S., we've raised rates at a very quick rate and with a 525 basis point delta between March of 2022 to last July's rate increase. That's a pretty fast clip. Now, Canada, the Bank of Canada began raising rates at the same time, March of 2022, but they went from 0.5% to 5% last July. So that's a 450 basis point clip. And that 75 basis point delta does not seem like much. But in this world, I think that kind of matters. So that's one driver to go and say less interest rate pressure on the Canada side. The second, I think, bigger driver is that we've hinted at this, but Canada property prices did not experience the same run up from 2020 or so till early 2022 versus the U.S. Here's one amazing statistic from MSCI's uh, quarterly property index, which they published for both U.S. and Canada, and somewhat comparable. The delta is more than 2x. You've got U.S. property values rising by over 20%. From like early 2022 or mid-2020, when we thought the world was ending because we were shutting down, that was one somewhat counterintuitive finding, right? Commercial property prices there was a slight dip for like one quarter. And then while the world was shut down, property prices kept increasing. 
Canadian property prices increased too, but only by around 10.2%. So that's much less of a height from which to climb down for Canada. And here's something for John, I think, to think about. Lending structures do matter. There's data out there suggesting that IO loans became more interest-only loans became more prevalent in U.S. CMBS lending from 2013 to 2021, went from around 51% of the total to 88%, according to TREP, for example. For banks and life goes, we do have more amortizing loans. So it's not all I.O., it's more like 38%, according to, to the Mortgage Bankers Association. But a lot, if not most of Canadian loans, are amortizing. You know what that means? That generally means lower unpaid balance and therefore lower LTVs holding V constant, less distressed debt, I think likely means less conversations around price declines and markdowns, right? It's a 50% LTV, for example, mathematically speaking, means you can take like a 50% price decline for your office property or your asset and still kind of be in okay, right? And so as long as you can pay uh, your interest and, 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 and balances, with a relatively healthy DSC. So really interesting geographic differences. And we haven't even gotten to just office physical occupancies, which are worlds different in the US versus say Asia. Back to you guys. You mentioned loan to value though, Tom, or uh, Victor. We it's one, That's one word. And, and Tom and I've talked about this a couple of times as well. We don't even bother to use that number anymore. It's, really uh, it, 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 yep. it, it's just, it, it, it doesn't even need to be in your mouth. It, it's, it's very clearly, it's just cash flow. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. What cash flow is coming in? We've been talking through this the entire time is, are they still making a payment, the payment? Uh, And uh, Tom is often a a glass half full kind of guy. I always appreciate the optimism that comes out of of him in these kind of conversations. But Jack, you've mentioned it. Victor's mentioned it. Cash flows have been good. It it isn't uh, Armageddon yet in that regard, uh, but you can see some cracks and extend and pretend is real. But Tom, I don't know if you'd like to kind of expand beyond that or not. Yeah, you're 100% correct, right? And we talked about this earlier. Cash flows remain reasonably strong, maybe a little bit below their long-term averages. And from a forecast perspective, we need to see some stress in the economy before we're really going to see that type of downward pressure on rents and occupancies, right? Obviously, yes, there's some structural change going on in office and there are properties, neighborhoods, cities that are gonna struggle more than others, but this is not financial crisis. We don't have a lot of bankruptcies out there yet. And as long as people stay reasonably employed, hey, listen, our peak unemployment rate is a shade over 4% through the cycle, right? I mean, that's pretty unprecedented. If if you were to ask an economist years ago, hey, would you take at at the trough of of a cycle a 4.2, 4.3% unemployment rate? They'd say, yeah, that's basically full employment to begin with, right? So if you're going to maintain that employment base and you're going to maintain consumer spending a bit, corporate profits should more or less be okay. And we should continue to see rent payments being made for retail, industrial, and for multifamily from those households. Again, office in certain locations, a little trickier. Right. So if the cash flow stays good uh, on a, a lot of properties, we'll, we'll could, uh, you know, still, still have the value. But just on the, the interest expense thing and the maturity default. So what is the plan of real estate developers who are entering maturity default or uh, asking for for modifications or extend and pretend? And at what point, uh, John, might a bank have to say in their SEC filings, oh yeah, actually uh, the delinquency rates are going up. I mean, I know they report delinquency rates, uh, non-accrual status, non-performing loans, but at what level will they actually have to tell investors, you know, this is getting a little shaky here? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think you're starting to feel a little bit of that. Uh, We we have seen the delinquency rates rise. It's still... Uh, it, what you kind of a word you've heard a lot in the last two or three quarters worth of earnings is normalize. We've we've gotten through uh, all of the economic stimulus, uh, what Mark Zandi and I have called the economic morphine, if you will. That was the five trillion dollars that was dumped down on the on the you know consumer. 
as those savings are working through and, and those properties are starting to be identified as who the winners and losers are, as the watch ratings are starting to you know, appear on the annual reviews, that, that really comes back to my comment before on talking to our customers to, to look at that next 12 to 18 month window and, and be honest um, if, if this is going to be a person who's going to be able to pay this back or not. And if this is a property that if you were forced to foreclose and repurpose, that there's a real you know, chance of, of you know, loss of principal and, uh, and, and make your plan. So Jack, to answer your question very specifically, if those conversations are, are happening right now in boardrooms and ALCO committees and credit committees, uh, commercial loan officers, credit officers are having should be having hard conversations, uh, but are encouraged by their regulators. Um, all of the big three, OCC, FDSC, NCUA, are saying, work with your borrowers as best you can, uh, but you know, start to manage risk as you start to see problem assets pop up. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean for what's coming in the next year or, or two years? It's just, I guess, more defaults mathematically? I, I think you'll see those there's a reluctance right now. There's a hesitation, I think, right now for institutions to take losses. Um, they're still coming around to hire for longer. A number of our customers that just believe the Fed is going to cut rates tomorrow and, and we're all going to be saved by Chair Powell and, uh, and a 200 basis point instantaneous cut. And uh, I mean, you can hope for that. But uh, I mean, I think we've all kind of seen that hire for longer. And to Tom's comments, uh, elevated rates for a longer window of time seem to be what's going to happen. And, and amazingly, the, the economy has been resilient. Uh, as those institutions start to come to grips with that, uh, and, and that's really kind of what we saw happen in the second and third quarter, uh, as we've kind of worked through uh, or the latter part of the second quarter, people kind of come to grips with that this summer. All right, I've got, a, I've got some assets that I need to get rid of. Uh, I've got some that I know aren't going to make it. And that's strategic sales, Jack, or what I would call them today. I wouldn't call them forced sales. Uh, picking who the winners and losers, the trophies in the trash, and pruning the portfolio. Uh, that's really the, the word of the day. Yeah, you, you've seen some large banks go ahead and put some large portfolios on the market and have had a little bit of success actually getting that transaction. You've seen that strategic default by some of the, the big players within office, uh, even a few multifamily strategic defaults out there just as they're adjusting, right? And I think that's what we're going to continue to see is this adjustment period. So maybe, maybe, I, maybe I asked the question. Sorry, Jack. Uh, so you know, the, I, I, and I know we've been hinting at it here too. But so much of where interest rates and policymakers are 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 going is very much dependent on whether or not we encounter a bump in the road in the economy. Right? You've got a lot of folks walking back from their predictions of that recession that never happened. I'll tell you right now that there was an adjustment to Q2 GDP. It was marginal. Inventories went down. It was actually positive. And it didn't change, for example, the near-term outlook of a forecasting outfit like Oxford Economics, which expects that real GDP growth in the U.S. can't deny it. It's August, almost September. It's going to be like 2%, right? But they're still expecting a bump in the road, maybe a 0.9% short, shallow recession early next year. Because their 2023 real GDP growth forecast is all of 0.1%, right? And so is that recession? Because if that recession does happen and it's not quite a soft landing, we might get that rate cut that a lot of institutions are hoping for. Where are you? That's not my job anymore to project these things. But Tom, maybe like where, where is that recession? What, what are we seeing? Are, is, is it not going to happen? What's 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 Mark Zandi's feeling these days? Hey, hey, listen, listen. High frequency GDP forecasts for Q3 are now well above U.S. potential, right? So that that says something right off the bat. I don't think they're going to remain. Those high frequency uh, forecasts are based off of numbers coming in from July that were pretty good, and some August numbers that were pretty good. So I think that will pull down a little bit closer to U.S. potential, which is between two and two and a half percent annualized. Uh, but we're still predicting that, you know, John said it before, that slow session a little bit. So we think the, that slowdown is, is coming, but there's not enough. There's not enough data. There's not enough indicators that we're going to enter this period of a broad-based economic 
recession, right? This, this type of recession that affects everyone across all industries for six to nine to 12 months. No indication of that right now, it would, it would take another shock, right? So I'm gonna be the economist here, and obviously we can't predict all of the shocks, geopolitical issues, oil price spikes, right? Things like that, especially a supply side shock right now would be problematic because that would mean, well, inflation's gonna be tougher to bring down and the Fed's hand's gonna be forced and they're gonna start to make that decision between their dual mandate of where to go, right? And then you have the potential for interest rates even going up if you have a supply side shock. So that's my biggest fear right now would be a supply side shock in the economy that causes the Fed to really have to think about where to go. And then that, you know, imagine a period where we get a a stagflation event or something along those lines where you have higher interest rates because of the higher inflation, because of that supply side shock at the same time employment starts to really deteriorate. That's when you see some some significant issues within commercial real estate and a broad based economic recession. So I just want to ask about that interest rate. If the Fed keeps rates higher or continues to raise rates, as you described in that scenario, Tom, uh, how frequent or how common is it in the commercial real estate developer world to hedge interest rate risk? You know, thumbing through a few filings of publicly traded real estate investment trust, actually, it's, it's quite common. And, you know, they, they hedge a decent amount of their interest rate risk. So they actually, you know, made a lot of money on paper as interest rates rose, even though their interest expense went on more, more than the derivatives gain. But uh, in, the, in the private world, and, you know, most of the commercial real estate, you know, based on what you said, Victor, is private, how common is that? Because if they were 100% hedged, which, you know, obviously no one ever is, this, this wouldn't be, be a problem. But uh, yeah, I mean, Victor, how, uh, how frequent is it for a developer to say, oh, yeah, interest rates are you know, going up, but you know, we actually hedged 50% of that, so it's not going to be nearly as bad. Yeah, there's actually very, very little systematic data because it's, it's private, right? But I will share an interesting perspective that is related. It is being seen as an opportunity for high-yield lenders in the space, right? If a lot of banks are pulling back because of tighter underwriting standards and just it's really hard to lend the office these days, where will capital come from? And I think there are a lot of like even life goes and investment management companies really taking a look at the high yield debt market to go and say, well, actually it is an opportunity, isn't it? If other sources of traditional capital aren't stepping up. And so I I don't think there's a systematic uh, data source out there that suggests that, that that captures that kind of hedging that that you're asking about. Unfortunately, Jack, back to you. Yeah, I don't deal as with as much with the developers as much as I do with the the bank lenders. And candidly, most don't hedge. Um, I mean, that's been a, a probably a systematic problem. We talked about that on the last uh, episode of Ford Guidance. We're on that a lot of the depositories are. Haven't been, didn't throughout all of this. It's been a problem for them. I think they've woken up to it of late. Uh, They're a little late to the dance and trying to hedge now that the rates have already kind of run on them. But generally speaking, no. And and specific to the loan portfolio, uh, not speaking to the bond portfolio, but specific to loan portfolio, we often don't see hedges. We might see swaps Mm -hmm. from fixed to floating. That might Mm -hmm. be some... Uh, some balance sheet management that, that takes place from time to time, but but a true proper hedge, not so much. Got it. Now let's put on this chart uh, from from your, uh, your team, Thomas, about uh, bank and life insurance companies lending to commercial real estate. So I guess this is uh, new originations uh, exploded higher in late 2020 and 2021, but it's, it's declined over the past uh, three or four quarters. Are you seeing there's, there's uh, traditional lenders, banks and life insurance companies pull back and the, the private credit folks you know, who go on the TV channels and say, oh, yeah, we're actually seeing opportunities to uh, you know, make loans at 16 percent to distressed office, office investors. Yeah, no, we've seen a good deal of pullback. Uh, and that's coming from guidance, obviously, when it comes to some of the larger banks. They're going to have to be more conservative. They're going to have to hold those reserves. So you're looking at very little activity. When I speak to a lot of my connections at the more regional and smaller banking institutions, it's it's relationship lending, right? They're, they're willing to go out there with those that have strong deposits within their institutions, strong 
relationships. They don't want to lose those relationships. They want to do good for those folks that have been sticking around and want to stick around for a while. Because again, there's going to be more opportunities coming out of this. So there's some lending going on there, but overall, it's it's pretty frozen. And then that leads to Victor's comment before as to opportunities for others. And, you know, this is this is going to be maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity for a variety of reasons within commercial real estate. Maybe it's on uh, the equity side, the lending side. Maybe it's, you know, for for certain investors that are have dry powder, have capital ready to go to deploy once some of that distress does come in that John was talking about over the six, 12 months. You know, there's there's going to be some good opportunities for sure. Now, I think this just real quick to add to that, Jack, you do keep on saying developers, right? There's the developers and the quote-unquote asset managers who aren't bringing new product to market but are managing existing stock. In the same vein, when you take a look at lending, and Tom, I did listen to your quarterly economic briefing a couple of weeks ago, I do think this originations chart also includes refi, right? So it's not just loans. In other words, if you want to make that nuance difference, and John knows this better than I do, construction lending, gosh, pretty much to a halt at this point. If Out of any, space, yeah. Refinancing everything we've been speaking about right now, the overall numbers for every type of lender, including non-bank lenders, is down about 38% for 2023, according to the latest forecast from last July from Jamie Woodwell at the Mortgage Bankers Association. So that's banks, Life Coast, CMBS, and everything, right? Down about 38%. To be fair, it was really only down about 8%. That's a moving target because they have to revise these things. But I do love their numbers because they actually collect it from lenders, right? That's why it also takes them time to come up with a final number because, hey, if a very, very large bank hasn't turned in their numbers, well, those numbers are going to shift. But their latest numbers suggest about a 38% decline in originations total for, for both construction and refi. John, are, are you hearing Yeah, no, that that's the feel, Victor. Oh, that's field, or what? Uh, 100%. That, that's, that's been the feel for a while, uh, and it is lagging. And quarter over quarter, we have seen lending kind of drop. It's it's liquidity-driven, Jack. They're they're waking up to, you know, CDs at 5%. They're waking up to rising cost of funds. They're waking up to the Federal Home Loan Bank, 5%. They're looking at the discount window, um, you know, the new... Um, process that they have for, you know, being able to pledge assets, uh, BTFP. It's, this is no, this is a great slide. It, it very much shows what's happening in the market today. Now that also is an opportunity. I've talked to a number of our customers too, as, as we've alluded to, and if they can find very attractive deals at, at debt yields and cap rates that are, you know, outsized to their normal uh, expectation because that competition has has retreated. We do have a couple of customers saying, I, mean, I, I think I can earn eight, nine, ten percent kind of returns on on a property I probably wouldn't even have gotten a look at before. It probably would have gone into a CMBS deal and it's coming to me as a bank loan. Um, so it, it has opened the door for a number of customers on opportunities that they might not have seen in, in previous times. Victor, I want to now ask you about multifamily apartment buildings, which is a huge asset class. We've talked about the problems in office, which are now you know, well televised and, and well understood, or at least somewhat. Uh, when it comes to multifamily, what what is how how severe are the issues there? I mean, I know you know rental prices are you know rents went up a lot in 2022, so that's good for you know, owners of apartment buildings, but also it's the interest expense. So how severe is the uh, threat of rising interest rates for multifamily um, uh, as well uh, for the for the owners as well as for the lenders? Uh, and then also, what are your thoughts on any fundamental weakness um, where actually you know maybe rents are stop going up? I will again let you know that. At- from an income driver's point of view, multifamily is doing pretty well with near record low vacancy rates, rents that have continued to climb, so much so that it's actually become a bit of an issue when it comes to housing affordability because rents continue to climb. That Tom did great work uh, basically flagging that for the first time in history, about 30% of all households are rent burdened. So I'm going to have him talk about that a bit. I will comment that couple of things. Number one, through the cycle, if I wanted to start with a glass half full, right? Multifamily and perhaps industrial logistics likely have 
great tailwinds behind them. There's a housing shortage in the United States, particularly in the affordable housing side. We need a lot more construction on that, and the financing of which is not coming through. John has confirmed that, at least in the short run. And so over the long run, the underlying demand for rental properties in the United States will likely remain fairly robust and certain in a way that, unfortunately, to compare and contrast, office demand is so uncertain right now. So through the cycle, multifamily is going to do great. But, but here's the bit of the caveat, cap rates, the yield in multifamily properties have also trended downwards in general, much lower or lower than other property types because of this favored status, because the prospects look so good, right? And so any kind of revaluation from cap rates that may be hovered, depending on the measure, anywhere from 35 to 4% to maybe a 5% cap rate will result in a larger drop in values, right? That's just the math. It's always been a skinny rabbit, right? The multifamily sector has always been highly competitive and, and very, very, very tight margins. So any kind of bump in the road, Victor, you're absolutely right on. But the difference, I think, in the U.S. especially, is that large presence of, guess who? The GSEs, right? And so the financing and liquidity for multifamily, just because of a predilection in the United States for home ownership, that's a fact, right? And very large GSEs out there really basically establishing a bit of a floor on how bad things can get for multifamily over the long run, that does complicate the analysis quite a bit. So Tom, maybe I'll, I'll yield the floor to you because you track the markets very specifically. Yeah, thank you, Victor. And it's been a little bit of a wild ride for multifamily, really for housing in general over the last few years. I mean, we're seeing, we've seen 20, 30, even greater percentage increases in rent since 2020 for a lot of markets. And this ju isn't just the Sun Belt. It isn't just those darlings markets that grew a lot because people decided to see what sunnier weather looked like instead of their, uh, their depressing, cloudy, uh, traditional home. It's interesting to see Victor teed, teed me up a little bit on the housing affordability side of things, right? For that first time ever, rent to income ratios, national level crested 30%, which is the HUD's definition of rent burden. That's a problem, right? We have a housing shortage of two to 5 million, various estimates out there, but it's a shortage for sure. And so this is important because while rent growth has slowed a little bit, right? I said it was flat over the last six months. I think that's fair and other data providers have uh, corroborated with that. We're gonna have rent growth again. We're gonna have record levels of occupancy, even with a pipeline of multifamily that's strongest on record, right? And I think that's what's important about this is you're hearing some stress uh, on the space market side of things, or you're hearing some concerns of stress on the space market side of things when it comes to multifamily because of this record new supply. But we also have an issue with single family and the affordability crisis there. And so that's helping demand hold up for multifamily, and that's allowing rents to stay where they are, if not increase even more, and occupancy levels to be very strong, and even lease up of new properties to be very strong. So cash flow within multifamily uh, really has, there's nothing there again at this point to say, Cash flows are going to significantly de uh, decline, and that would be the stressor of multifamily. Victor hit the nail on the head. The stressor is the 3% cap rates. This is the, the tangled web, though, right, Tom? Because shelter, of which rent is a pretty big part of, is one of the big inflationary numbers that Powell's so focused on, right? So you've got that circle. You've got home builders that got absolutely destroyed in 2008. So single family, we, we, to your point, we don't have enough units out there. Multifamily seems to be one of the few places we do actually have a lot of units coming online with. 
Um, so you have this kind of convergence of all those issues. It's true, John. I, I completely agree with you, but we're still sitting at about a 95% occupancy rate, right? And and yes, it's it's to me, it's a bit of an issue with the Class A properties. I could see some stress there uh, because most of the new construction is going to be Class A. It has been for the last couple of decades. And so you're going to see during some of that lease up period to compete, maybe some more concessions uh, to get butts in the seats for those newer apartments. Uh, Class BC, though, I mean, we're talking occupancy rates of 97 percent, essentially what amounts to fully occupied and frictional, you know, frictional vacancies, frictional you know, movements there as people move in and out. Uh, affordable housing, Litec properties, we're looking at 98 percent occupied and some markets, 99.5 percent right? Where there's a waiting list of two years. So yeah, maybe a little bit for certain markets, there's been overbuilding for class A, uh, super high end amenity filled properties Uh, that will factor in, right? Obviously all housing's related. It's an ecosystem. You can't look at any of those in isolation. Uh, But but uh, yeah, it's it's still a story of a shortage. It's still a story that from a mid and longer term perspective, housing is needed and housing will be filled. Of course, uh, real estate's local. And so migration matters to this. Uh, there's plenty of, of stories we can tell about where people are moving to and how that matters. Um, but John, as you said, you know, the Fed's watching this. They're seeing shelter, they're seeing the issues with shelter, and that's another reason why, you know, maybe the the neutral rate of interest is a little bit higher than it's been because, you know, there's this housing shortage, there's a labor market imbalance, and, you know, all those factors do matter into where interest rates ultimately have to land. And so, Tom, if the property was bought with a 3% or 4% cap rate when interest rates were at zero, what is the cap rate today? If you factor into the, the price, what would you get if you sold the property? Now, I would say maybe I'm wrong, but theoretically, a cap rate is impossible to be lower than a, a treasury rate, right? Because you'd never invest. Theoretically. In a, yeah. <laughs> you, you never invest in a, you know, a, a somewhat risky, you know, I mean, a lot more risky than treasury. Uh, property if you could just you know buy the tenure and and you know go to the beach. So uh, what are the what are the cap rates looking now? And the cap rate I think is a net operating income divided by the price you paid for the property. So the price you I'm going to enjoy watching this one, Tom. I'm going to watch you dance on this one. Put your tap shoes on, my friend. Put your tap shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of transactions we've seen with net operating income and the financing rates, we've actually seen negative leverage for multifamily over the last year, two years or so. Uh, With the expectation, realistic or not, that cash flow will be able to grow, capital, uh, you know, appreciation of those assets will grow over time. And the numbers will work themselves out when they they want to exit right am i wrong guys have you seen the same things different it's, it's hope hope's a big word uh, you can hope in one way or you can get cash flow in the other uh, you're kind of highlighting one of the issues that have kind of bubbled up here of late so negative leverage what does that mean tom so we're looking at a situation right where the interest you're paying on debt is higher than your cap rate, right? It's higher than the return. So the, you know, that's an issue, right? We're looking at a situation where, you know, it's going to be tough if you had to liquidate immediately in that type of situation. And that comes back to the credit shock, Jack. So far, no four sellers. If forced to sell in a, in a negative leverage situation, you might start to see things kind of spiral downward. And I guess we can now put on this chart, which is uh, shows the spread between buyers and sellers' price expectations. So what, is this, what, is, what does this mean, uh, uh, Tom? So we're looking at a situation where... Sellers still have that hope, still have that math in their own minds 
where rates come down a little bit, where cash flows are such that support higher values and buyers, they're not ready, right? They're, they're certainly not ready or willing uh, to go to that level with the expectations a little bit more of, hey, financing rates are high. That means from the mathematical perspective that I can't buy at that asking price. And Jack, in our last episode, we talked about how the mortgage market has kind of reset. Mortgage market and the consumer is ready for kind of, seven. Well, ready is not the right word, but it, it's come to grips with a 7% market. This is the example where the commercial real estate market just hasn't quite come to those grips yet. And this, I thought, was a great graph from the Wall Street Journal this morning. And, and this is what I would call that gap between a buyer and a seller. A seller still wants par or better on their, their, their loan. The buyer saying it's just not worth that. Uh, as we project the cash flows going forward, it's a discount, uh, and and that's what often turns into a no trade in my world. Just we're too far apart in price. The bid ask is just too wide. It's a bridge I can't cross. So th and this is this is from MSCI, right? Yep. It was in the journal this morning, but correct. Yeah, MSCI was the the source for it. But th this is the challenge in the commercial. Road. This is why you're not seeing the valuations. This is why you're not seeing the transactions. This is the issue that I'm seeing on the trading side of loans these days. Yeah, Victor, what are you seeing in the, the multifamily world? Uh, what's your take on apartment buildings where, okay, the cash flow is still really good. It's grown, but the interest expense, it's it's grown so much that I guess you have a lot of properties. I, I, I don't know if Tom indicated a percentage or a number, but, we're, but yeah, you're paying more in interest expense than, than you're getting in rent. That's a problem. It, it is, but... Remember, and the, you can be cynical about this or somewhat optimistic, right? If you're looking at a single asset owner, then that math works. If you're looking at a portfolio of properties, then there's a bit of depth here when it comes to pockets and making sure that the overall free cash flow is able to service the debt. You've got one property that might be underwater, but you've got trophies and trash. As John said, you've got more trophies than trash. You can actually make those debt payments, right? And so we tend to look at commercial real estate because we do need to simplify from an atomistic perspective, right? Oh, one property has rent that has gone down and the loan is attributable to that one property and the uh, interest and you know, principal payments are much higher than what the income, not just rents, right? But you got to take a look at the income uh, there are expenses here that need to be managed, right? But if you're looking at a portfolio, then you might actually be doing fine except for one or two dogs, right? And I think that's where this slow-moving train becomes more complicated to call because a lot of these large institutional investor types that are willing to disclose a lot of price data and income data to us have a portfolio of properties, right? It's, it's not single asset, single borrower. So is that, that that one loan that they took is not directly attributable to that one property that may now be subject to default and or foreclosure. Yeah, Victor, this is somewhat off topic, but I think it's worth mentioning. You alluded to the expense side of the equation, and that's we didn't we haven't talked about that enough, that expenses are rapidly rising. We've done a lot of research on the insurance end of things, and it's an exponential growth when it comes to insurance within multifamily. And that is problematic too to all of this. We're talking cash flow, we're talking, you know, rents and occupancy still holding up strong. But that expense side is worrying for multifamily too. And I think it is a valuable part of this conversation. Yeah, those that are electing to self-insure, I mean, a couple of hurricanes, an earthquake, gosh knows what, you know, you, you can have a real problem in that regard. So, um, and the cost of that insurance is doubling, tripling in some cases. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's right. an issue. Yeah, 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 you're right. Where we get into localities, right? You're like you know, Florida and California and Tom, the research that you guys did on like just we have insurers pulling out, right, of, of these areas. And that's always been a problem in Florida. We know that for sure. California, a few insurers are, are making statements about what they're willing to do or how they're willing to grow or not grow uh, within those markets. But 
Yeah, I mean, we're tracking this incredibly closely at, at, on the Moody's side of things when it comes to uh, the geography of some of these climate risk issues. I mean, the problems are there and, you know, it's no longer this you know, politicized thing. It's the reality that insurance rates are going through the roof. So what does that mean? for commercial real estate in these areas and what type of revenues, what type of cash flow has to be coming in to support that, right? And that I think is, is gonna continue to evolve and continue to be an interesting conversation, even when it comes to the migration story, right? All of this outward South Sunbelt migration, can that maintain to those cities that are in the line of, of the storm, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, what are the resilience? You know, there's so much into this conversation that I think we have to have over the next, we have to be having it now. We should have been having it five, 10 years ago. Um, but it's going to be heard more and more. Over well, the it's next creeping into the cash flows now, right? It's creeping into yeah. the expense yep. associated with the loan, with the with the risk and the asset. I think that's a fair statement. And so I don't think we've seen a lot from the portfolio perspective of anyone really shying away. I don't know, John, on your side, you know, has there have you seen anything like that where oh, I'm staying out of this market or that market? But I think it's coming, or at least it's it's part of the conversation more than ever. Not based on that comment, Tom, but I mean, we have certain lenders that are only retail, only hospitality, only uh, multifamily and, and only certain geographies just because they're a regional lender, but but not someone specifically saying, I just, I won't do Florida and the panhandle. They just get hit by hurricanes too often in the insurance. Too expensive. We haven't had those specific comments yet. Is there uh, any difference between uh, other parts of commercial real estate we haven't really talked about, hospitalities, hotels, retail malls, stuff like that, where they... Uh, uh, the, the fund, fundamentals, but also they're differently impacted by uh, rising rising interest rates. So I guess we yeah do let's kind of do a lightning round on the the CRE asset classes we haven't talked about. Uh, Tom, let's let's start with you. Retail having a bit of a moment. We're not seeing much in terms of declines. Those happened within the last twenty years, and those happened for those specific assets, Class B C malls. Obviously, there's a lot fewer of those now. There's still going to be uh, even less of those going forward. But we're seeing some interesting models of redevelopment. I'm a big fan of uh, lifestyle, live, work, play, master plan communities. That's just a pet pet interest of mine. And I'm seeing a lot of positive momentum there. I love walkability. So that's just my own thing. But I see retail actually doing well in those areas because there's a, it's a critical mass problem with retail, right? If I'm going to convince somebody to not shop online, I can make it really easy if the store's a five minute nice walk in its own community, you know, and, and there's all kinds of interesting things going on there. Bed Bath & Beyond with its closures, uh, L.L. Bean's moving into some of those, Burlington Coat Factory. So this is no longer a retail story of an apocalypse. This is an evolution. Retail's always evolving. So I'm actually pretty bullish on retail and its its movement forward. Uh, would a warehouse still Tailwinds. It's interesting because I'm gonna, I'm going to counter my own statement here because e-commerce still has some tailwinds here, right? But this, it it's an omni-channel. It, it retails now omni-channel. E-commerce is going to be there. It's going to continue to grow, but that doesn't mean brick and mortar can also continue to grow with it. Uh, but with e-commerce growing, you get more strength within the warehouse side of things. Logistics industry is changing, so lots of opportunities still there. There was concern for overbuilding, but I honestly don't see it. I think actually some of the supply chain and labor issues the last couple of years have helped not get into an overbuilding warehouse situation. So that's been actually a silver lining of some of those issues. So I think there's still tailwinds there. Um, I'll leave it at that. Let the guys uh, comment on any other sectors or, or comment on those sectors too. Yeah, yeah, Victor, your, your thoughts on hospitality and, and retail, and also uh, if, if you're comfortable talking about office in Asia, which you, you say uh, you know work from home is, is largely an American phenomenon, so offices in Asia are doing well, but also I've got to ask you 
about China apartment buildings where they're at super high valuation as, as well as homes. And uh, they've been going through a real estate, uh, you know, I think we can call it a crisis for oh, well over a year now. So just, yeah, what are you, what are you noticing in, in China? A uh, few points that you had touched upon and Tom had touched upon as well. I'll step back to to go and say, if you're looking at the institutional investors world where they're taking a look at other asset classes outside of real estate, right? So for every, these are large sovereign wealth funds. These are typical investment management funds, the big Blackstones and so on and so forth of this world. They have been on a basically uninterrupted clip of allocating more and more of that institutional investment capital to real estate. I'll quantify it for you. In 2022, I think the actual number was around 10.8% in real estate, right? The, the stuff we're talking about right now, the other stuff that they could invest in are real assets, infrastructure, timber, agriculture, and so on and so forth. This year in 2023, they're expecting it to go up marginally to 11.1%. Then it becomes a question of conviction or whether or not they'll still continue to invest in the asset class. That's intent versus actual. It's sentiment versus where the dollars are actually going. That's an open question because 2023 isn't done yet. But again, let's say alts are becoming more of, uh, we call alts anything outside of the top four or five core food groups. Apartment, office, retail, hotel, right, industrial. Outside of that, you'll see Blackstone making all sorts of news about why data centers make sense. I don't think Jack Farley, Tom LaSalvia, or John Tuig's family will be consuming less data in the near future, right? Are your children going to be serving the internet? I don't think so because mine certainly are. And so is there a play for data centers, not just in the US, but also worldwide? That's definitely currying favor for stability when it comes to near counter-recessionary income movements, self-storage by one survey is getting a lot of capital allocation. Why the self-storage tend to benefit counter-cyclically in recessions? Because during a recession, typically households and businesses tend to move, right? They downsize, they may change jobs, lose their jobs. Anytime there is some kind of movement of households and businesses, where do they have to keep all of their stuff in self-storage? And so what's interesting is where this sector took a slump in recent years, and Tom will back me up on this, is because they got in their own way. We were putting in too much supply of self-storage that kind of outstripped demand that really was not falling as much. So alts, right? Number one, more to real estate. Number two, a little bit more to alts in this search for yield in a higher cost of funds world, right? Let's see whether or not that works. And then when you take a look at just geographical differences, Jack, because you brought it up, we're at, uh, what's the latest Castle number that you guys have seen? They publish it every week or so. We're still under 50% physical occupancy of office space, right? Despite three times, I think this is the third fall season where employers are going to try to make a pitch to get people to come back to the office, right? It, it's still under 50%. In Canada, it's around 52 to 53%. Jack, gosh, in Asia, we're back to 80, 90, 110% of 2019 averages. So offices, in fact, are doing just fine in pockets in Europe and Asia if you link it to physical occupancy and where that asset class is going. So talk about just diametrically different approaches to the same asset class because of different geographies. As for China, I'm going to take a step back because every so often, cyclically speaking, Everyone likes questioning their business model, right? What are the headlines that you see out there? China is headed for a hard landing. They have printed too much yuan. This is not going to work. Their growth rates are slowing down. Newsflash. If you go from a fairly closed economy in 1978 to the second largest economy in the world, you are going to grow a little bit more slowly over the next 40 years versus the last 40 years, right? So it's a size problem. And number two, there's this great clip that I saw aggregating just news items from the West about China's business model. They were predicting a crash since 1990, right? So this, I, I'm a little skeptical about what, because economies are complex. Economies are very complex. So you're right. Are there a ton of white elephants in China when it comes to overvalued real estate investments? Entire towns that were built because it was centrally planned. 
there is an entire town adapted after a very, very quaint British town, for example, down to the pubs. Maybe they also serve fish and chips, but it's largely empty because guess what? Supply didn't follow demand. The demand didn't follow supply. They built it, but they didn't come, right? And so there are those idiosyncratic examples in China, but it's a very large, complex economy. Did you know China has just one time zone, Jack? I didn't. It goes from east to west, right? And we're struggling with time zones here in the U.S. Imagine China, an even wider country than us, where you say good morning at 2.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. Right? So it's run a little bit differently than the United States. And I'd be super just careful about broad brush assumptions about where their real estate is going. I, I'm not saying you you have to be very careful when it comes to just different geographies. I do speak the language, for example. Uh, my wife is Chinese. And so that's one thing that I had to do, climb the Great Wall. But it, it's a humbling experience just now sitting where I am, talking with our folks out of the Hong Kong area. I was just there five weeks ago and just realizing how different these markets tend to be. And, and how much of Chinese real estate is owned by foreign institutional investors? Oh, very, very. So I don't have the numbers right yeah. in front of me, but it's it's small. And in fact, I think it's receding just because of with unpredictable regulatory regimes sure. and like a lower chance of like, would you invest if you had some doubt about liquidity and whether or not you can take your capital out? It's There are those quote unquote institutional and regulatory uncertain you think policy is uncertain in the u.s oh gosh like it's a whole other conversation in other countries so i'll leave it john i want to close just by asking you your view on the u.s banking system and the the, the loan market in general so a very broad question uh but you know you had a lot, a lot of worries just about uh, banks, how uh, in your conversation with Randy, how have those changed over the past uh, three months? So when you're looking at uh, defaults, originations, deposit costs, has your outlook, uh, you know, how has your outlook changed? I mean, higher for longer is still there. So, you know, loans remain pretty deeply underwater, just like bonds remain pretty deeply underwater. And, and, and the, the kind of continued rate up has not helped. Uh, institutions are still struggling for liquidity. They're still grappling with, you know, a higher cost of funds uh, and working through that. They're really kind of back to my comment before on trying to manage margins. It seems as if the SVB crisis is behind us, the, the mini banking crisis, as they call it, which happened to be bigger than 2008, but that's neither here nor there, um, you know, but coupled in a handful of, uh, of unique institutions, um, so I mean I'm 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 surprised that um, higher for longer is going to continue. I think it's going to be uh, higher for even longer. Might be the way to uh, to kind of to look at it. And again, the thing that I'm focusing on is is really credit and defaults. Where we've seen some stress has been the lower end of credit, the younger end of credit in cards and subprime autos. We've talked enough about I think commercial real estate here. Mortgage mm -hmm. I think has been a winner. So far, maybe lowest defaults some, in 50 years, right? For mortgages. Yeah, maybe some challenges in the FHA space, but I think generally speaking, mortgage is probably going to be the hero this time and not the villain. We've seen strong growth in HELOCs. We've seen strong growth in autos, things that are shorter on the curve. Not a lot of interest at all in 30-year fixed rate or anything with extension and duration. I think institutions have enough of that already. Uh, and so they're working through that. But yes, the normalization of credit, yes, the bubbling up of delinquencies, the bubbling up of charge offs, kind of getting back to a 2018 kind of vintage, 2019 kind of vintage of losses is where they are. And then just institutions wrestling with that net interest margin compression. Loan volumes are slowing um, and, and they're working through uh, deposit and liability issues. So in the Wall Street Journal article, they said over the next six, 12 months, it could be a good buying opportunity, great use to use some dry powder, money on the sidelines. What is you know, each of your individual outlooks for, you know, if, if we have this interview in, in a, a year, which I would, would love to do, um, what, what are we going to talk about then? What are delinquencies looking like then? What are cap rates looking like then? Uh, interest rates. So I want to you know, get you just kind of your broad, quick outlook over the next year. Uh, uh, Tom, then Victor, then John. We've got another 8 to 12% decline across uh, most asset types in terms of valuation. Uh, we've got cash flows remaining relatively strong, as we've mentioned earlier. 
the economy slows a bit, unemployment increases a little, uh, but we're not going to see interest rates come down dramatically. Thank you, Victor. If what Tom was forecasting makes sense, and if the bid-ask spread comes down, I think we may be talking about, as some folks have ma- said, said here, a uh, pretty great opportunity when it comes to investing in, in real estate. You do have to be very careful, and you still have to take a look and kick the tires quite a bit, but all the signs are pointing to significant price declines, and the opportunity there for maybe off-market deals to just get in there and go and say, now we're going to go take a bet on what others perceive as a risky asset. Because that, that, that's exactly that point in the business cycle where we should be uh, making bets on uh, the future as a being conservative. So, Victor, just to be clear, you're not saying right now prices are so low, it's a great opportunity. You're saying the, if prices, if uh, you know, if uh, privately marked prices go down to match those publicly marked prices, right. and there could be some real bargains on the table, yeah. like prices go down it more. Spread, right? It's, it's yeah. when sellers finally come to the table to go and say, yeah. I agree, and therefore we're going to sell at X. I don't think a lot of buyers are in there right now thinking, oh, well, okay, well, if prices are going to drop another 10, 15%. We're not going to execute now, but we're going to see what's going to happen over the next six to 12 months. John? Uh, I, I would echo a little bit of what Victor would say in that I think a courageous, opportunistic buyer is going to do well, uh, but he's going to have to be met with the seller that's willing to let go of the asset. And then we're going to need to see that bid and ask spread kind of come together uh, absent any kind of a, of a credit shock. But those that are willing to kind of push in on assets very specifically that they know and have you know good mastery of that particular sector will probably outperform those institutions that take maybe a, a broad base uh, look at that, that particular uh, opportunity. Um, I, I think higher for longer persists. Uh, I'm more in the camp of a, of a cut that happens uh, you know, mid to late next year. Uh, I think Goldman Sachs came out and said June, July of 24, which feels about right, maybe even a little early. Uh, and, and a slowly weakening economy, much like we saw in the jobs number uh, today, where we hit kind of that. I think slow session is is a is a is a good look. I'm not saying I like that particular outlook, but it does feel that way today. Thank you, John. Uh, You've got a great report called Let's Talk Loans on LinkedIn, all about the banking system as well as the loans. So people should check that out. We'll include that in the description. And uh, Tom, people can find you and your team's work at cre.moodysanalytics.com slash insights. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for being so generous with your time and insights. And thanks everyone for watching.